Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to six things that we learned from Swindon Town to Bradford City nil. If you do go on to enjoy today's video, please make sure to drop a like on there for me. If you're trying to 80 likes on today's video, that must be appreciated. Subscribe if you're new as well. We are on the road to 8,000 subscribers, so please make sure you are subscribed if you haven't already with that post notification bell on. It's free to do so, and it does massively help out. Get your thoughts in as well down in the comment section down below. Let us know down below your thoughts on our six talking points from today. Today's video. I am today joined up by Corbin after you all hounded Frank out last week. Corbin is back and we're doing it slightly different for the format of today's video. We normally talk about our six things and then whatever the updates are on potential ownership changes and all that sort of stuff. But some uh, rumours have come out over the last 24, 48 hours and I think it's been quite telling from the club because there's been articles posted on the club's website but nothing's really been mentioned on social media. It's been very, very quiet and there's been some rumours of a takeover. I think it was... This afternoon, there was rumours of an American investment group who were apparently in talks to buy us. Um, as always, you know, take things with a pinch of salt and all that sort of stuff. We know that the club has been up for sale, but Rupp allegedly wanted £10 million. Um, And then there was an update posted uh, a couple hours after that saying that it did have legs. They came over a few weeks ago, apparently, assessed the situation, the lack of assets, the hard work it would take to improve things, and the valuation um, basically meant that they pulled the plug because they only wanted to play was a maximum of £7 million and obviously Rupp thinks he can get 10 even though we own absolutely nothing we have zero assets and we don't even really have any players worth anything apart from potentially Jake Young so disappointing again I feel like you look at teams with all due respect like Carlisle, Gillingham getting these takeovers because they're previous regime and not asking for ridiculous amounts of money and they probably own things even though they might not have the fan base that Bradford City potentially do because they've got actual club structure and they've got assets it makes them technically more valuable than Bradford City which is frustrating but if this is true which again take it with a pinch of salt disappointing that it hasn't gone through and there's been a rumour as well which I would say they take this one with many pinches of salt because I don't believe this one whatsoever. But apparently Andy Cook is going back to Mansfield. Again, I don't personally believe that because Andy Cook doesn't like Mansfield fans. Mansfield fans don't like Andy Cook. Andy Cook, I'm pretty sure, had fallen out with Nigel Clough. It was Clough who let Cook go originally. So I don't believe that one personally. Although if Cook was to go there, he'd do absolutely exceptional at Mansfield. I think that is the sort of system that he would thrive in. But again, I really can't see that one happening. And apparently Brad Halliday's had offers from League One clubs. Pretty understandable with him only having six months left on his contract and nothing really seems to be happening from that point of view but just some quick updates again I think it's all nonsense especially the Cook and Halliday stuff the takeover potentially it might have been true but obviously disappointing that nothing has officially come of it yeah I, I, I don't think um, I think any news of a takeover is promising because we've, we've all heard and many people try to push under carpet but he is interesting we have to say two to four, I think, a month, uh, Rupp said before. But when you're pricing an, a, a, a business like Bradford City at £10 million, then, you, you know, you, you, you're you pricing people out of it. And apparently they've walked away from the £7 million, uh, that they've offered. And I, I don't blame them. I mean, why, why would you want to pay £10 million for a club that's um, meandering towards the National League? I mean, it's just ludicrous, really, from a business perspective, to put into some of it, like you say, has no assets. Yeah, like we mentioned a few times, Rupp's never going to get that £10 million or so that he's wanting unless we're a League One football club. But we're not going to become a League One football club without him investing more. So I think in the long run, if he invests shorter in the short term he'll then eventually get more money in the long term but he unfortunately doesn't want to do that at this moment in time but like i say it's all just rumors and paper talk well not actual paper talk but you know what i mean like stuff that's been going on on social media and i thought it might be a good opportunity to update you at the start of this video and we normally talk about it at the end so i thought i'd do the format a little bit differently this week but on to the six things we learned then we start out with box number one with a red for ash taylor how many times this season are we going to have to come on here and say that he's just not good enough and slightly maybe not his fault because for some reason we were playing in a high line. Obviously, Stubbs was playing on the right side. Kieran Kelly came in on the left side and you had Ash Taylor in the middle. Graham Alexander said post-match that he didn't think Tompkinson played well on Tuesday night, so benched him. Crazy, crazy decision for me. If Ash Taylor was still in that team, he was really poor on Tuesday night. Lost a number of headers to Matt Smith and the ones he were winning was kind of hitting him in the face and going straight to a sulfur player. But Taylor against Swindon, 
one of maybe three or four players you could definitely pinpoint as someone who was involved in that second goal. So, so frustrating. It's a simple ball in behind. Taylor is either not tight enough to his man or he's not anticipating the ball in behind and already starting to drop off. And by the time that he's turned around, it's taken him two to three working days to turn around. He then starts running. And as we mentioned before, he's just far too slow. I mentioned it in yesterday's match reaction. He runs like he's running in quicksand, like he's got cement in his shoes. He's slow. He can't pass the ball. He's all right. Sometimes in physical duels when it's strikers like Oli Palmer, but when they're ridiculous in the air like Matt Smith, he really did struggle. But again, I think most people would struggle against Matt Smith at this level. But yesterday for me, highlighted again why, one, you definitely can't play a high line with Ash Taylor in it because it simply doesn't work. He gets dragged out of position, very similar to what happened with Salford's goal on uh, Tuesday night just gone by. He originally gets dragged out of position and that means Stubbs has to come over, but Rydow's bombed on, so it just allows for all the space. And with how slow our defence is, Ash Taylor was never the right signing for Bradford City. Whoever signed him off, getting him getting a two-year contract was criminal. He should have moved on this January chance window. But again, Alexander's picking him week in, week out. And it's really, really confusing to me. But Ash Taylor, definite red box yesterday. Just simply not good enough. Yeah, definitely. I mean, like you said, uh, when you look at why did we sign him, you know, he's, he's, he's not a ball-playing centre-back. He can't play in a high line. And uh, I don't understand why you take out the, the quickest centre-back, clearly, in Tompkinson, out the back three, put Taylor in. And I, I don't see what he's seen in him to keep playing him in the last few games. But so I saw someone put it, and I definitely, I 100% agreed with it. Why is he keeping changing the back line? You don't change a back line because they've got a, that's the centre of the pitch where you've got to form partnerships and an understanding of the chemistry of each of them, unlike any other part of the pitch. And every game, there's a different centre back coming in. And uh, th th there's constant mistakes going on in the back line. I think we've conceded nine goals in um, in Alexander's first few games. It, since Bauer, we've conceded nine goals in the opening 20 minutes. And that, that's because centre-backs aren't, aren't getting that understanding of each other. And Platt were a dead start. You know, he was starting every game, consistent player. Now he's fifth choice and not even on the bench. Kelly got dropped on Tuesday, now he's back in. Tomkinson, for me, has been the best centre-back this season. He's now on the bench and Taylor keeps getting picked over all them and teams are exposing him week after week. I mean, you know, there's a lot of questionable decisions by Alexander and picking Taylor consistently is another one of those. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. You make a very good point there. How many times really we've we seen it in the past where a manager chops and changes defence this much, unless it's through injury last season, which Mike Hughes did, or maybe suspension, he didn't really change that back line all too much where Alexander is chopping and changing it all the time. I think a lot of people, generally from what I've seen on social media, their preferred back three would be Tompkinson on the right, Kelly on the left, and then one of Stubbs or Platt in the middle. For me personally, I think at this moment in time, I go Platt. I think Stubbs has been better over the last couple of matches, but yesterday against Swindon did have a really, really poor game for me. Ash Taylor, though, I don't think I've seen anyone who would say that Ash Taylor is in our top three best centre-backs at this football club, but that's concerning because you saw the way Ryan Spikes was banging on about how good our recruitment has been, but Ash Taylor is the epitome of the type of signings we've made traditionally over the last couple of seasons, and yeah, a really, really poor game for him yesterday. I mean, we went on our six-game winning run, and Matty Platt was a big part of that, and now he can't even get onto the bench. He's not been on the bench for the last two games, which is really, really baffling to me. We are going to get on to Graham Alexander, though, later on in today's video. So we'll move on to box number two. It's a yellow box for Jake Young. His first appearance for Bradford City of the season. It obviously confirms that he will be staying with the club until at least the summer, which is obviously positive news. We didn't get the offer in that we weren't maybe hoping for. And it's good to see that a club didn't just bend over backwards and kind of accept the highest transfer fee, even if we didn't really think it matched our valuation, which it looked like there were strong rumours he would be going because there's some sort of financial hole we've got, apparently. Again, so many rumours and stuff coming out from the football club, but because there's a real lack of communication, you don't really know who to believe because it's very much he said, she said at this moment in time. But Young, in terms of his performance, obviously came on at half-time at four. Andy Cook. I think that was a, certainly a big surprise that came out of the game yesterday. Andy Cook subbed off at half-time. I can't really remember the last time he was subbed off, never mind at half-time. So a big statement there from Graham Alexander. And I thought, Young might struggle a little bit playing as the lone striker, but I thought he did quite well. He put himself about a bit, had some really nice touches, and it was nice to see a striker with a little bit of mobility and actual control of the ball because Tyler Smith, he's unlucky not to get a red box because I think... 
the thing that summed up Tyler Smith the most yesterday was we had one opportunity that he had that I can remember. And I think it was Halliday who put the cross into the box. And there's about a 10 second move, maybe 15 seconds, where Smith is offside the whole time. He's three yards out and he doesn't even hit the target. And that just sums up Tyler Smith. For me personally, third choice at the absolute maximum this season should Tyler Smith be for the remainder of the campaign. But Jake Young, like I say, had some really nice touches, held the ball up well when he needed him to. Do I think Alexander's system is going to get the best out of Jake Young? Absolutely not, because he's definitely not a target man. I mean, you might as well carry on playing Tyler Smith as a target man at that point because Young is very good technically. Unlucky not to score as well. I think he pinned the defender very well, spanning, got a shot off on that left foot in the second half. And it was a good save from their keeper. I think was actually making his debut yesterday. But Jake Young, the promising signs were certainly there. I feel like the, the more time goes by while we're still not winning football matches, the more you're going to see Jake Young's form dip because... This style of play is certainly not going, to, not going to get the best out of Jake Young. He needs chances. And while he can create something out of nothing, he certainly needs more chances rather than just to hope that he might score a, a couple of wonder goals like what he did at last season. But the positive signs were certainly there. And that's why I've gone yellow for Jake Young. Yeah, he came on, looked confident, tried to make an impact. But I think, like you say, that'll quickly change after winning the team playing under Alexander's football. It ain't going to get the best out of him. Under Flynn, he were coming off the left, playing in a highly possession-based side under Alexander. And his first 45 minutes, he's thrown up front on his own with his back to goal, trying to hold off two big centre-backs. I mean, he's never really going to play his best style of football there and he's never going to get the best out of him. So he'll just be another player who comes in with a lot of promise, a lot of hope and expectation, and we don't get the best out of him. And that, that keeps happening um, with, with players who come, come into his football club. But um, with, with, with Cook coming off, I, I've, I've had a feeling that Alexander's been a bit frustrated with him in the last few weeks because in the post-match interviews, he's come after the strikers saying they should be doing better with the chances that have been coming into the box and the crosses. And, you know, he, he's been throwing Oliver on, he loaned him out and then Cook, he's brought him off after 45 minutes and I wasn't really expecting that. So it's, it's definitely an area you need to look to improve. Um, but like I said, I don't think he'll use Young in the best area. And, you know, what, what formation do you think is the best one going forward? Because I think I thought he were going to go back to the 3-4-3. But instead, he's gone back to the um, the 3-5-2, if, if you like. What, what, what would you go with? I don't really know what our best formation is to be honest with you and I think that is one of Alexander's problems he one minute we're playing the 3-1-4-2 the next minute it's a 3-4-3 we ended the game playing a 4-2-3-1 yesterday and you can't keep chopping and changing all these formations we started out playing a 4-4-2 as well I feel like for me personally the best formation that we've got to get the best out of the players we've currently got is probably a 3-4-3 but again do we have the two central midfielders to be able to do so I feel like we struggle a little bit in that area because where does Jamie Walker then potentially fit into a 3-4-3? So, yeah, it is very hard to pick what is the best formation. I think that is certainly a problem that Alexander is having at this moment in time. Yeah, and, you know, it goes back to him constantly chopping and changing the side, doesn't it, and not sticking with some... Obviously, that six-match winning run, he kept with a consistent winning side, which I liked. But then now it just seems like he's going into panic mode and he's just trying to throw some at the wall and just hope it sticks and nothing is. Um, and maybe it comes with obviously wanting to assess the squad with it being January, trying to get rid of a few, say, you know, he wants in, in the summer. But I don't think he'll survive the summer, but we'll probably talk about him in a bit. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. And like you say, we'll talk about Alexander and his potential future at Bradford City later on in today's video. So we'll move on then to box number three. It's another red box, this time for Richie Smalden, a man who I've been very appraisal for, certainly under his time under Kevin McDonald and now Graham Alexander. But yesterday for me, really, really poor. Should have been sent off as well in that first half. A clear kick out on, I think it was Saidu Khan, over on the near side as you're watching on iFollow, should have definitely been sent off. Thankfully, none of the officials saw it and he didn't see red. But again, it's set pieces. I mean, did we have a successful set piece? I remember two or three specifically where he's clearly aiming for Ash Taylor at the back post. Now, whether it's a problem with the delivery into the box or the way we've set up the set piece, I'm not too sure. But I think it went two or three times, just went straight over Ash Taylor, straight out of play. Or he might have got a slight 
glance on it and it went straight out of play again. And you're not going to score set-piece goals by having poor deliveries into the box. And again, it's another frustration that comes from Richie Smallwood. All the fans can see it. I feel like generally he's open play. Performances have been quite good. Yesterday, I thought he was quite poor. Wasn't really winning many second balls. Seemed to have be getting very frustrated with the referee. Obviously, picked up a yellow card in the game as well. And again, like I say, was very lucky not to get sent off. And it was a disappointing performance from Richie Smallwood. But I think the frustration originally comes from his set pieces and unfortunately a real lack of quality from them. You've seen times when Jamie Walker's been taking them and Harry Chapman seems to be much better, but I think Walker is certainly our best set piece taker for me. Obviously, we had Scott Banks last season, who was pretty good on them left-footed in-swingers, but the small set pieces aren't particularly great. I thought his open play performance was quite poor as well yesterday and obviously he's been getting criticism with him being the captain and him not coming out and addressing the media after the game and yeah, it's a red box for Richie Small for me. Yeah, just on that media stuff, he, he, he's always sort of bottled talking to the press. I mean, last season, I remember him walking off the pitch a few times after, I think it was Carlisle, I might be wrong with that, but he did it a few times, just walking off the pitch, not clapping the fans, not going to media, you know, not really owning up to a bad performance from him or, or the team and taking responsibility. And as a Bath City player, not least a Bath City captain, you need to stand up when when, you, when the chips are down. And for me, he, he's always got his head down when it ain't going his way. And you, you've seen recently that he, he plays in much better in, in a winning team and a team with quality players around him. And maybe, you know, he is League 2 quality. I think he's shown over his few periods of good spells that he, he, he is a League 1 top-end player. But when, you, when you're looking around and you're seeing that you know, the players that are down, the person you need to be more, the player you want to look at to motivate you and to pick you up when you're on the ground and everything is against you as your captain. And he doesn't do that enough. And for me, you know, it, there's got to be questions asked about his um, his, his personality around the, the pitch because for me, there's bigger characters there who can take on that role. I think a big telling factor was on Tuesday night, you could hear the players a lot more. Obviously, there not been many people there. The atmosphere wasn't particularly there. And you could hear a lot of the conversations from players and I would say I've very rarely heard Smallwood throughout that game. I heard a number of other players, obviously, they are all moving around and Small being in the centre. He's obviously slightly further away at times, but I think I only heard him once and he was nailing somebody for being lazy. I specifically remember that word coming out of his mouth. But we'll move on then to box number four. This time it's a red box at four Sam Stubbs. Like I mentioned, I think over the last couple of games before this, Stubbs has been quite good at playing as that left centre-back since the game against Derby County. But again, yesterday it was a similar performance that we've seen quite a lot so far this season from Sam Stubbs where he just wasn't simply at the races and I'm not really too sure why that is he looked kind of out of position he looked like he was playing on the wrong side but surely with him being right footed he would be much better as a right sided centre half than on the left side but again their second goal I think the fake shot or, or certainly I think it's Paul Glatzel who cuts back originally it's kind of really obvious to see and Stubbs goes to ground up far too easily and obviously he's sprinted over to cover for Ash Taylor and then that just leaves their man at the back post completely unmarked with a tap. And I thought it was quite a poor performance. There are a few times in the game where he just got skinned completely and got left right in the dust. I don't like saying that phrase because it came back to bite me last time I said that. For, uh, so thank you, Gillingham fans. But he did. He got completely skinned on a few occasions by Swindon. And like I said, I've been very appraised of him over the last couple of weeks. But yesterday for me, really, really poor performance from Sam Stubbs. And he normally is a little bit of a leader out there, but I didn't really see that from Stubbs. He wasn't really encouraging the team. But again, I feel like Gilead's the same. He wasn't really encouraging the team. And they are two people who you do normally look to to be seeing them trying to galvanise the troops and get people going again. But as soon as we conceded, everyone just... I mean, we didn't start out great. The performance we started out was flat. But as soon as we conceded, everyone's heads were down. And I didn't really see... Certainly, if looking on iFall, anyone really trying to galvanise the troops and try and lift everyone's heads. We didn't really see that, unfortunately, yesterday. And I thought Stubbs' performance was really disappointing so I've gone with the red box for our number 15 Yeah I, I mean I feel like I'd just end up repeating myself to what I said on Taylor so I'll keep it short and sweet if I, if I can when talking about say that's hard but I, I think again like you said he played on the right side of the three against Salford I thought he had a good game and against Colchester I thought he had a pretty good game on that left side and yet he, he completely changes it again and instead of playing a player where he's done well recently, 
he completely changed it and he's on the opposite side then. And then he's got to form a new partnership with Allardy and, uh, and and still tailor to, to the next of him. But then it's it's completely different. You've got to play on the right side. I know you said that it probably suit him better because it's his preferred foot. But throughout his career at City, I don't I can't comment on Exeter, but he's always been on the left side unless they were playing with Critchlow. And that, that one that often last season it was mainly plot um towards the back end of the season. So yeah, I I, I thought that, that was an odd odd move for, again from Alexander to change that. But yeah, he didn't have the best of game. He looked fault for the goal and you, you know, his, his pace is a worry when you're playing him alongside Ash Taylor. And again Tuesday night to go back to that unfortunately. You know, he took Tomkinson off and played Taylor and, and Stubbs in a back two. I mean, how, how concerning is that? But uh, yeah, enough said on that. I think Stubbs, you know, he's, he's got he's to gotta try and get a bit more consistency in, in his play. Yeah, I mean, we've mentioned it, you know, a few times so far in the video about the constant chopping and changing, but it's not just as simple as moving someone from one side of the fence to the other, because like you say, Brad Halliday and Liam Rydog as wingbacks are completely different players. You know, you know that you're going to need to be covering much more if you're playing at left centre back, because Rydog hasn't quite got the legs, hasn't quite got the energy to be getting up and down as much as Brad Halliday does. Rydog's got a bit more experience, but halliday has got maybe a bit better quality on the ball. So you've got to kind of just quickly adapt and change things. And I know that in football, as a professional footballer anyway, you should be able to adapt and change. But then partnerships come over time and playing with each other week in, week out. And, you know, Stubbs traditionally last season was playing, as you say, on the left side, apart from the few games where he did play with Critchlow. So he has a much better relationship with Rydog than what he does with Halliday. So to be constantly chopping and changing, again, must be very confusing for the defenders. And you know, I feel like that sort of stuff is how you do go about losing a dressing room, trying to keep everybody happy and trying to give everybody minutes. That is traditionally how things end up going wrong. And it certainly is going wrong for us at this moment in time. But we'll move on then to the penultimate box of today's video. I've gone with a yellow box for Alex Gilead. Now, the only reason why he's coming away from this game with any real credit is... Again, he put 100% effort in. And unfortunately, we are having to credit people who were putting 100% effort in because there was people again yesterday or players on that pitch who I personally don't believe gave their absolute everything to try and win the game for Bradford City. Gilead's quality on the ball was pretty poor. I certainly noticed that, especially in the first half. I think he actually put in the cross for Andy Cook for that free header, which was our only real chance in that first half. But... Apart from that, I thought there were a number of passes that he was under hitting. He was trying to dribble with the ball and lost it a couple of times. And I know that quality on the pitch wasn't particularly great. It seemed very dry. The ball wasn't really moving as crisp as what we would like. But I did feel like his quality on the ball was quite poor. But again, you've got to give a player credit who's putting in 110%. And I think the same can be said about Brad Halliday. While you don't really notice Halliday as much for me yesterday. I don't really feel like he did much right. Don't really feel like he did much wrong. You could certainly see you as someone who was putting the effort in and, you know, cares about the results of this football club. And unfortunately, it felt like yesterday there was a few players who were only there really to pick up the wage. They weren't too bothered about the result. And that is a disappointment for me. But like I say, Gilead, I thought on the ball, quite poor, to be honest with you, you know, wasn't really showing his leadership traits that he has done you know, over the last, I'll probably say two or three years, really, since he's rejoined at the football club. But I feel like you've got to give a player credit if they're at least trying, because unfortunately, some players just weren't trying yesterday. Yeah, and unfortunately, when you're looking at a professional football team, that's the um, standard, that, that's the minimum you should expect from a team, especially that of a Bradford City team. And Gilead, yeah, I agree. I don't think technically he's anywhere near one of the best footballers. But in terms of knowing what you're going to get, a sort of utility player you can use and the players you know you can rely on. He's going to give 110% every game. He's a, he's a Bradford City player. He's got the right mentality. 16-17, I think, was his first season. Got him again 17-18. So he's been with the club during the best times and now he's here at the worst times. You know, this is the lowest um, it, we, we've been in terms of the, the league position at this moment in time in January. And, uh, you know, it, it is worrying times, but he's, he's got the right mentality. And I've always said, if you have a team of Allardy and Gilead, players who give effort, energy, and have that work rate mentality that you need, you, you'd be a top three side. Because you've seen Stevenage sides and Carlisle sides who haven't got the quality of what Wrexham have at the minute, but they do have that uh, personality and work ethic that you need to go up. And a lot of these players, like you say, just don't have that character 
for a Bath Tier team and a Bath Tier fan base can resonate with. Yeah, I definitely agree. You know, sometimes when the going's getting tough, you've got to be put your backs against the walls, you've got to show some bollocks. And I just feel like there's a number of players who don't, they sink, and that's simply not going to work at a, a club like Bradford City. But before we move on to the final box of today's video, I do just want to give a slight uh, a slight shout out to two of our substitutes yesterday, Lewis Richards and Kevin McDonald, who came on. And I thought them two, again, had a pretty positive impact on the game. It was great to see Richards back out on the pitch because hopefully that means we don't have to watch Liam Ryder attempt to play football anymore because how many times have I mentioned it this season? He's simply not good enough. And McDonald came on, showed some quality on the ball as well but I don't really feel like they did enough in the game to give them a full box for so I do just want to quickly give them to a little shout out but move on then to the final box of today's video it is a red box for Graham Alexander we spoke well well I personally spoke about him quite a lot in yesterday's reaction which was a little bit of a rant thank you all very much for the support on that video I didn't expect it to do as well as what it did so thank you all very much Thank you all very much for checking that one out. But Alexander, I was really disappointed with again yesterday. Team selection, completely wrong. Tactics, completely wrong. Credit to him for making three changes at half time. I feel like that's not really something he's done too much. Maybe the Notts County away game. Apart from that, can't really think of any other halftime changes. I think maybe when Osadibe got a start in a game, I can't remember what game that was. It might be Morecambe and Clark Adore came on potentially. But Alexander... He just got it completely wrong. Again, he's picking players, the same players who are letting him down week in, week out. We've got real quality on the bench. You are barely getting a look in. They might get 15, 20 minutes off the bench here and there. Bobby Poynton, his creative stats this season have been excellent. Gets 15 minutes at the end of the game when the, he's pretty much done and everyone's head's already down. Harry Chapman, we've seen, has got quality at this level. And again, what did he come on at halftime, playing slightly out of position, I just, I'm quite baffled by Alexander. Like Matty Platt, not even including the squad. Kieron Kelly randomly can't get back into the team somehow. And then when he does, obviously, he's going to be a little bit rusty. And unfortunately, he does give that penalty away because he's chopping and changing, changing the defence. Players can't build partnerships. He's changing the wrong players. And without repeating myself from yesterday's video, I said it when Alexander was appointed. The length of contract is a massive concern when you look at how long a lot of managers have been at Bradford City for over the last couple of seasons. I think only Mike Hughes has managed at least a year in the job since is it maybe Stuart McCall days. Like he's absolutely criminal to be honest with you. And yeah, Alexander for me, definite red box, got it completely wrong. And I feel like he probably won't survive the full length of his contract. And I think if I'm being honest, I'd be surprised if he's here at the end of the season because his football is horrible to watch. Again, I feel like he came out in his post-match interview and spoke quite well, but it's all well and good talking a good game. We now need to see some action on the pitch, and it feels like slightly... I wouldn't say he's lost the dressing room, but the players are not fully on board with him at this moment in time. And I've gone with the red box with Graham Alexander. I certainly think he could be doing more to be getting the better, the best out of some of these other players that are just not good enough. And I'm just disappointed in Alexander, if I'm being honest with you. So I've gone red box for him. Yeah, but one thing we can't say about Graham Alexander is that his football is not entertaining. I mean, Ryan Sparks is what I've like said. I mean, it's just it's just a joy to watch. It gets you off your seat. Um, you know, you, you're hooked to the game. You can't take your eyes off it. I mean, it, it is the most entertaining football you've seen since um, since Mark Hughes. I mean, it's it's fantastic. I, I can't get enough of it. But no, there's there's not enough urgency in our play. I think when you see um, teams come come to Val Valley Parade. They they have free kicks. They take them quickly. They try and catch us off guard. You saw it against Swindon. You know they they turn the ball over quickly. Ball in behind our defence. They get a goal for it. We don't do that. You know we we take ten minutes to kick the ball from free kicks and we we play it out from to our centre backs. They take a few touches and do fit aimlessly to Cook or Jake Young. And you know there's no rhythm to us. There's no sort of um, pattern of play and I get that you know you can hoof it but have a bit of rhythm to it you know that there's just not, not not none of that and there's no connections and that comes from team selections not picking the right players constantly changing the side and you know against Doncast on Tuesday we'll change seven players from the starting lineup, and then you know if if we get some from that game you know we'll make a few tweaks um and, you know, you're just never going to form partnerships, like you say, that'll lose him the dressing room. Um, you know, he came out after the game and said, we give the opposition too much respect. You know, we, we were too deep at times. He's called, he's called out the, the strikers for not 
um, converting enough of the chances. You know, the, the defenders, he called out for saying that they weren't committed to, to a few of um, the, to, to the defence because a few of them have come, they weren't connected, a few of them were pressing when there shouldn't have been, a few of them dropped too deep. And, you know, if, if that becomes a rhythm and a pattern from his post-match interviews, it's all, you know, well, well and good, but it's still early days for Alexander. What's it going to be like if we are in a relegation battle in April? Because it could happen. The next set of fixtures, eight of our next ten games are against the top half. You know, it, 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 some 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 has got to give that. And you know, Forest Green, although they're not getting performances at the minute, they've just I, I had um, is it Steve Cotwell? Or, you know, you know, he's he's a good manager. And they've they've spent this window. That they're ambitious. You know, that there's good Salford, Colchester, they're all teams. I can see finishing above us because we're just going one way at the minute. So, you know, how bad do you think it, it can get? Yeah, I mean, I think Sutton and Forest Green are maybe a little bit too far away to potentially catch us. But going into next season, I'd be very concerned, to be honest with you. I've got Ryan Sparks' his full quote here about Graham Alexander. He said, credit to Graham who has come in and got us playing a brand of football that I think is enjoyable to watch. I mean, I'm not going to say that he doesn't know what he's talking about, but it seems like every time he opens his mouth, he says something stupid about football, which comes back to bite him in the backside. I mean, the leaner and meaner squad, they're not accepting mediocrity. Alexander came into this window saying that we were very prepared, you know, stuff had been going on since December, we were looking to trim the squad down. I feel like the squad is only maybe one or two players lighter than what we were and the quality of the squad is considerably weaker we've made two signings Sam Walker who was less than impressed I think he's made maybe one or two saves in his first three games I think he's been really really disappointing and Tyreek Wright who managed one game before picking up an injury because we decided to play him from the off on a horrible pitch and no surprise his body breaks down he hasn't played all too much so far this season so I feel like the January trance window has been nothing short of an absolute disgrace because the squad is, in terms of quality, a lot weaker. As poor as Harry Lewis has been so far this season, he's still much better than Sam Walker from what I've seen so far, apart from maybe Walker is better at coming from crosses. But I feel like he's so glued to his goal line. It's so, so frustrating. The amount of times where the centre half, I've seen it a few games now, I'll tell him to come out for the ball and he's just stood there waiting for them to either kick it back to him or just kind of hoping the defenders deal with it. And that is a big frustration for me. But like I say, Alexander's team selections could definitely be better. I think his tactics could be miles better. And I don't want to be hypocritical and say, you know, we need to play loads of football and pass it around the back because, you know, I was doing the exact opposite when Mark Hughes is here. But we've got to get a good balance. I'm not saying that we need to play 20 triangles in our own penalty area, but I'm also not saying that we need to boom it up to Tyler Smith every time we get the ball and opportunity. And most of the time, it'll end up hitting Rose Ed or they, the opposition just get the ball back because Andy Cook isn't a target man. He's all well and good heading the ball inside the 18-yard box, whether that be offensively or defensively. But he doesn't really win much in terms of build-up play. We need a real target man. We had one in Videl Oliver who got an assist yesterday for League One side Steve Nidge, who were currently in the playoffs up there so I feel like Alexander isn't getting the best out of a lot of these players and obviously Jamie Walker coming back to fitness in the next few weeks will be massive for us how does he fit into this team what formation system tactics would be go to when Walker's back but we can't be overly reliant on just Jamie Walker you know there's rumours Ash Hunter might be signing because obviously Alexander I think has signed him on four separate occasions but do we really need another winger attacking sort of player I mean Apart from centre-half, that's probably our most stacked position. We still need a left wing back. We could probably do with a central midfielder in on loan. And I'd still wouldn't say no to another striker because Matt Derbyshire, as we know, is old enough to literally be a granddad. You've got Tyler Smith, who, apart from in the AFL trophy, hasn't really impressed so far. Jake Young, you don't really know where his head's at and doesn't really suit Alexander's style of play. And Andy Cook is clearly getting very frustrated because he's been starved of chances. So is Alexander the right man to lead us forward? Do you think he will, for one be here at the end of the season or two, do you think he'll eventually get us promoted out of League Two? Um, I'm, I'm not confident he'll be here next year. Uh, I, I do think he needs to be, not just for Ryan Sparks' sake, for getting another manager wrong, but also I think for a bit of direction for the club and a bit of connection, I think we, we, we need someone who's going to be here. I, I do like how he speaks. You know, I, I know I said, how long will it last going players out? Well, you know, you find out who 
a mercenary is you find out who don't want to play for the manager and for the club and you get rid of them and you build around those. But there's a lot that I'm seeing that's just not making me confident in him. Um, so I'm, I'm contradicting myself, but I'm just contradicting myself with everything that I think about Bradford City because on, honestly, there's nothing that I can see that can last um, going forward. But what, what was the other question? Do you think he'll eventually get us promoted? No, no. Promoted from National League North, maybe. But <laughs> not, not, not League, not League One. It's, yeah, it's not going to happen. It's just, uh, it's just a very depressing time to be a Bradford City fan. I, I think he will be here by the end of the season. I think Spikes has to stick with him because this is his last appointment. I feel like. If he gets this one wrong, he might actually resign himself. And I feel like Alexander needs to be a bit more adaptable in terms of his tactics. It's all well and good who hoofing it and booming it every time you get the ball. But when you're not really creating chances from it, it's not enjoyable to watch. You're not going to sell season tickets. And again, we're just going to go through this cycle of, well, if we're not selling season tickets. Our budget's going to be smaller. Our team's going to be worse. And you're going to be playing worse football with worse quality players, which would be a massive concern for us. But we'll leave it there then for today's video. Thank you very much for tuning in. If you have enjoyed, please make sure to drop a like on there for us. If you could turn it 80 likes, as we said at the start of today's video, that would massively appreciated. Subscribe if you're new as well. We are on the road to 8,000 subscribers, so please make sure you are subscribed. If you haven't already with that post notification bell on, it's free to do so, and it does massively help out. Get your thoughts in as well down in the comment section down below on the potential takeover and the six things that we did go into discuss in today's video go check out Corbin's channel as well the link as always is down in the description down below thank you all for watching have a great rest of your day and i'll see you very soon for another one peace